Welcome, Alec. <laughs> Our thought is that uh, the Burgundian theme today, naturally, we are focused on generally two varieties in our region. So we're going to start off with a Burgundian theme centered around Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, um, the, basically the two great whites of our region, apart from Sauvignon Blanc, sorry. Um, and then the Burgundian theme being Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, and a little bit of Gamay in there as well, sprinkled in. Um, whites and rosés coming at lunchtime, if you're joining us for lunch, and then this afternoon we're touching on the futurists and uh, regions outside our main regions, uh, essentially. So why are we here together? Well, we are both from the same latitude, uh, similar latitudes, in the 40s. Um, we do center around similar uh, ge geographical landmarks, um, and our sustainability efforts are some of the key themes that you'll find running through our culture of the wines in our region. So here we go. As you can see, <laughs> am I loud enough without the mic? Anyone? Do I need a mic? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so here we go. So southern hemisphere, 45 degrees latitude. Uh, New Zealand actually sits down between the 36 and 40, early 40s and Oregon sits up between 42 and 46 degrees latitude. So very similar latitudes. We're both in the new world as far as wine and making countries are concerned. Important to that latitude is the effect of UV light and our proximity to the sun during the growing season. So the tilt of the earth actually gives both Oregon and New Zealand very unique growing seasons in terms of the UV capacity um, and, and influence on the grapes and the growing season. So the tilt of the earth during the summer means that our, our, you know, we're very warm, very close to the sun during that growing season, um, higher UV impact. So we all know that grape vines are influenced uh, during their ripening and growing season by heat, but they're also heavily influenced by sunlight and UV. So photo degradation of the skins um, leads to complex flavors and ripening flavors in our wines. So there are some similarities between the Pinot Noirs and the Chardonnays that are coming from New Zealand and Ireland in terms of our um, climate and ge geological positioning. The impact of a lack of ozone in the southern hemisphere over the ripening period uh, has the effect of sunburn, just like we would as human beings. You, you need to create um, your own version of sunblock and grapes have to do that as well. But in terms of evolution um, for that, doesn't isn't happening um, very, very quickly. So what happens is the effect of sunburn on grapes in, in New Zealand means that viticultural practices have had to change and um, absorb what is happening in the vineyard because of a lack of ozone and that sunburn, which means canopy management needs to change a little bit and dappled light uh, on the vines in certain vineyards have to be um, specific. That dovetails into the idea um, of how vineyard management has evolved over the last two decades, we'll say, and the effect of sustainability practices both in New Zealand and I imagine in Oregon as well. And the sustainability message is perhaps one theme to take a look at when you're judging these wines today for yourself and whether or not you can taste different intensities of flavour and whether or not that might correlate back to vineyard practices um, directly. Yeah, Does that make sense? So uh, we are ex have our own pressures down under in terms of sunlight, UV. You do need you know, sunglasses when you come to New Zealand. Those of you who have been down, you know you've got to wear them, right? So anyway, carry on. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think just carrying on with the sustainability message a little bit, that um, with the 
one of the major projects of New Zealand wine growers from ar around 2000, launching in 07 and um, the, the aim to make New Zealand 100% sustainable by December 31st, 2012, uh, although that wasn't quite achieved, we are sitting well above 95% in terms of our producers. In fact, we're knocking on the door of 100% of every single producer in the country being certified sustainable. And that is uh, a very, very strong message moving forward. And it is the only country in the world that has that 95 plus percent um, certification. I think that the message of sustainability coming through in Oregon, and you can probably pick up on that, is strong because it has to be when you're dealing with a lot of small producers. Yeah, in terms of sustainability in Oregon, you know, generally half of the industry is certified sustainable, and the other half of the industry is possibly, uh, you know, more than sustainable in terms of their certifications for biodynamic certification and organic certification. So Oregon is the largest uh, certified biodynamic producer in the U.S. We have 35 percent of certified biodynamic vineyards, and that leads back to you know some of these factors about about our latitude, about that amount of sunshine that we do get, which allows uh, for you know healthier grape growing and lack of powdery mildew and uh, other diseases able to be present in the vineyards. We, because of our latitude north, we still get very cold winters, and the ability to let you know pests and disease die off over the winter instead of being in somewhere like Australia where the winters are very warm or California where you don't get you know, winter kill. In our climate, you get winter kill, so you get the pressure you know, lessened during that season and then we have a nice dry, warm, sunny growing season as we move through the year. Um, another similarity of our climates is, or, or our regions is that we're also centered around the, um, the ring of fire, as, as we call it, which is essentially uh, all of the active volcanoes, um, we are basically sitting on in New Zealand uh, and Oregon. We have volcanoes surrounding us um, and sitting on you know, tectonic plates um, as well. So we're very active. We have, you know, for grape growing, that means that we have very young soils, you know, less than 50 million years old, which is very young in terms of, um, you know, grape growing around the world. You know, New, uh, Australia has much older soils. Um, uh, even you know, Africa has much older soils than what we're dealing with um, in our volcanic and marine sedimentary soils that happen throughout uh, regions. So when the tectonic plates shift, we're getting the volcanic activity, which is the youngest soil activity, um, coming on top of marine sedimentary soils. Um, that have been uplifted from those ancient you know, seabeds when our islands and state was underwater. So we're getting mixed young soils that really impact our uh, grape growing in terms of um, the nutrient management. Right. Absolutely. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Can I just have a show of hands? Uh, two quick, very quick questions. Those of you who believe in climate change. Okay. Um, and those of you who believe in global warming as opposed to climate change. All right, because of the incidence of warming and the polar caps melting, that if you can imagine um, New Zealand's proximity to the South Pole and those, that polar cap is melting, the very, very cold currents that are coming up the east coast of New Zealand is having the net effect of keeping us cooler so it's actually sustaining our climate a little bit more, but the change that that has in the weather patterns through that ring of fire has to, um, it's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy in that that current change and the climate change at the same time, things are getting more dramatic, more, more dramatic weather events. And so the preparation for that, the impact in that ring of fire, especially in the areas like Oregon and its proximity to the coast, most definitely in New Zealand on the eastern side, which is where all the majority of our vineyards are anyway, we have to be prepared for what's happening, what's coming in the future. And a quarter of a degree warming for us has a major impact on um, the ripening of our fruit. So 
weather events in 2017 when it was raining. 2018 looked pretty good for most of us. 2019, we got some massive frosts that we weren't expecting in uh, the bottom of the South Island. So everything is about being aware of change because of this. In Auckland alone, there are 56 um, dormant volcanoes. So we live in and around volcanoes. So we're not going to get an earthquake in Auckland. We might in the South Island, as you know. But we're very exposed to what's going on globally in terms of climate and change. So thank you for putting your hands up. Okay, we want to get your taste in wines quickly uh, because we have 20 wines to get through, or almost 20 wines to get through. So um, we're going to run through very quickly, uh, get you familiar with our states and regions. So Oregon, we are on the west coast of the US. We're above California and below Washington, just for those who haven't been there. Um, we have 19 different AVAs, but the majority of our um, AVAs and the bulk of our wine growing is centered in the Willamette Valley right here. Um, so this is our largest growing region, which is um, planted to nearly 20,000 uh, acres of vines. And this is our primary area for Pinot Noir production. Um, this is one of our newest ABAs, a vineyard in one of our new ABAs, the Van Dusa Corridor ABA, um, where you can see the surrounding mountains and rolling hills there. And this is the snapshot of our region in terms of uh, production per ABA. So American Viticultural Area, for those of you not familiar with the term ABA. Um, we do share a number of ABAs with um, a, a border, uh, Washington. So we've got the Walla Walla Valley ABA, which we share with Washington, um, and Milton Freewater, uh, the Rocks District of Milton Freewater, um, a very new, detailed, soil-specific ABA. In fact, the only ABA like that in the US. It's been defined entirely by its soil series, and we'll try a wine from that this afternoon, um, is entirely within Oregon, within the Walla Walla Valley but we do share that region with Washington. So you'll see wines with Walla Walla Valley, um, ABA on it, issued from both Washington and from Oregon. Um, th that said, if the wine is grown in Oregon but made across the border in Washington, you can only have an Oregon labeled wine from that area. You can't call it the ABA that it was grown in. Um, moving west towards the coast, we move from desert region essentially from the Cascades um, into the Columbia Valley and now we're moving into some more uh, Pinot Noir and Burgundian style varieties so more aromatics more influence from that cool ocean influence coming in and then Portland sits right here and the Columbia River is essentially the border with Washington Portland sits right at the mouth of it and we flow down into the Willamette Valley from Portland all the way down south of the capital Salem and into Eugene and that is the entirety of the Willamette Valley. It's a very large AVA, AVA, it's three and a half million acres. So there's a lot of land to still be planted considering that there's only about 20,000 acres planted already. Then we move into another large AVA, Southern Oregon, which encompasses the Umpqua Valley, the Rogue River Valley, and the Applegate Valley. Pinot Noir accounts for 58% of the plantings in Oregon, so it really is our major grape and king grape that we focus on. Um, Pinot Gris follows that when the vines were first planted, we had uh, aromatic varieties planted alongside Pinot Noir. Being so far north, when the original uh, pioneers of Oregon came to plant the grapes, there was really no other red grape variety that really even had um, a potential to ripen in the Willamette Valley in 1965. So when David Lett came up, he planted Pinot Noir. Um, Dickie Rath followed later, but he planted a number of different varieties like Merlot and Cabernet Sauvignon, and they would rarely get ripe in the Willamette Valley. So Pinot Noir really became what was reliable and would actually ripen as a red variety, and it's become the state's grape, major red grape variety. Pinot Gris, Oregon was the first commercial producer of Pinot Gris in the US. Did anyone know that? Oregon, first producer of commercial Pinot Gris in the US in 1968 from David Lett's original vines. Um, and so that's a you know, very historic piece of, of US wine culture and wine history um, that tends to actually be fading a little because of the price points that we can receive Pinot Gris from, from in you know, export areas. 
Uh, all of these other major grape varieties are also grown, the noble varieties. Chardonnay is increasing as we get better clones of Chardonnay and uh, begin to understand better sites for Chardonnay as well. And then in the uh, warmer AVAs, we have the Rhone and Bordeaux varieties as well. New Zealand. Okay, very long, narrow country. You can see the maritime influences with the Pacific Ocean uh, off to the east and the Tasman Sea off to the west. And this um, has a dramatic impact. It forces, really, viticulture to be on the eastern side of both islands, with, the, with a single exception in um, the province of Wellington. There's actually a, a, a west coast um, region developing there. And in the far north, um, on the very far northwestern side, there's a little viticulture going on up there. Essentially, we are dealing with um, climates that are very, very cool with extremely high sunshine hours and it extends our growing season. That means we can ripen Pinot Noir very, very successfully year in, year out, even with a dramatic weather event or two, that, that can actually happen. We have 11 wine growing regions, the smallest of which really is the Waitaki Valley in North Otago. And uh, we are subject to our own geographical, geographical indicators system. It is something that has been part of the New Zealand wine history for, gosh, uh, when Australia got their GI system underway, we started ours as well. And that's really from the early 1990s moving forward. Not all of them are registered and up and running, but essentially when it all happens, we'll have 22, just to put that out there. Um, the soils in New Zealand get older the further south you go. So the backbone of both islands really begins in the middle of the North Island where the Southern Alps rise, where you see that big Lake Taupo creating the first of the rain shadow effects. Anything north of um, Taupo, we'll say, in that parallel where Gisborne is, um, is subject to zero rain shadow effects. So whatever happens, happens. So it's all about site selection and soil and moisture. And then moving further south into the South Island, that backbone of the South Island protects everything from the prevailing weathers um, coming in from the west. So a lot drier, but cool. In terms of soil age, about 38, 40 million years old, you might find some marble fossilized sea life about 50 miles inland um, in North Otago, Otago. All right, may I have the next slide, please? With the hills, Marlborough, nice picture. Okay, this is the good one. All right, um, you can see the vast majority of New Zealand's reputation is based on the growth uh, and the production and the export of Sauvignon Blanc. End of that story. Um, Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, you'll see just, you know, a little shy of 5,600 hectares of Pinot Noir, which isn't very much. Um, 3,000 odd hectares of Chardonnay, which isn't very much. And both of those also supply our sparkling wine sector as well as still table wine. And you get to try a couple of bubbly a little bit later on today. There are more producers in Oregon than there are in New Zealand in its entirety. So we're around 695 producers in total. And they're categorized according to the volume of production. But the idea of Chardonnay is in every region of New Zealand, as is Pinot Noir. The biggest voice of Pinot Noir really does begin in the province of Wellington, moving across to Nelson, Marlborough, Canterbury, and the Otago province. But we do grow those varieties everywhere. Thank you. Uh, aromatics, of course, are very popular for us as well, hoping to show you some of those later on. Shall we taste some wine? The idea of this is for you, uh, you know, not, not to coin a phrase, but really to get your, a, a deep dive nose into these wines. We love you to ask some questions. We do want to tell you how these wines are made if you're interested in that. And um, a little plug first and foremost for the water that you're drinking, Antipodes water. Um, a lot of people mispronounce it in New York, calling it antipodes. It's Antipodes please, with a Z on the end, is the world's best water. It's being voted twice and won twice. So we hope you enjoy um, the palate cleansing effects of that and how it actually promotes texture and flavor in wines, especially Chardonnay and Pinot. Excellent. Right. So if you want to uh, nose your Chardonnays, and we'll talk a little bit um, while you're 
nosing them and maybe coming to you know, some conclusions about any similarities or differences in uh, style, in aromatics, um, from, the, from the Chardonnays in front of you that are from mixed bag from both countries. Um, you'll find that we have uh, primarily Willamette Valley um, Chardonnay in front of you with one also from the Columbia uh, Gorge. So this uh, AVA up here, which is you know, 2% of, of Oregon's production, it's very tiny, uh, right around um, the town of Hood River, which is just a you know, stunningly beautiful town, which is city situated on the foothills of Mount Hood in those ranges, and it's very forested and looks over the amazing um, Columbia River and uh, really is affected by the winds and the, um, the impacts of the Pacific Ocean that come in here. Um, so on this very end here, it's sort of a horseshoe shape uh, centered around on that river and then back up into where it basically becomes mountainous and you can't really plant vines. So a very small area, very forested, um, quite close to, um, to uh, Mount Hood. And the Chardonnay that's grown here um, tends to be a little more opulent in style than what comes from the Willamette Valley in general. This is because of um, a, you know, a drying wind effect and a little bit more um, opulence on the palate. And then we move down into the Willamette Valley, which is essentially the only, um, you know, the valley is bordered on both sides by mountain ranges. The Cascade Ranges on the eastern side block any of incremental weather coming across the continent and really protect us from any dehydrating wind um, influence in the Willamette Valley. And then there's the Cascade Range, which is a low-lying, um, sorry, the coastal range on the western side, which is a low-lying mountain range, which buffers up against the Pacific Ocean and our Oregon beaches. So this um, mountain range lets just enough um, or buffers just enough that we're not shrouded in fog for the majority of our growing season. But that low-lying growing season on the coast range, oh, sorry, that low-lying mountain range, um, really does let in a big, you know, a large number of wind influence and of rainfall um, and Pacific storms that come through. So we really are impacted by the end of the season and beginning of the season by any of the storm systems that come through the northern Pacific. So they get pushed over from Japan, they come down from Alaska, hit the coastline, and come into us. And so that's really what ends our seasons in either September, October, or November, depending on how lucky we are that year. So we are a very um, vintage variation um, growing region in our state. Um, the Willamette Valley makes 82% of our wines, and Chardonnay is increasing in volume there. So traditionally, you would have um, been taught that Pinot Gris is the major grape variety in the Willamette Valley. It is still uh, has more acres under vine than Chardonnay, but that's actually uh, becoming very, very um, marginal now, and Chardonnay is about to overtake Pinot Gris. So. Uh, it's not that Pinot Gris is being torn out or anything, it's just that we're not planting a whole lot more of it. It's um, you know low cropping, it's expensive to make, and it's not necessarily economical unless you're making really amazing wines. And what we're finding at the moment is that Chardonnay, with the clones that we're now getting in Oregon, and the higher elevation sites and the warmer vintages that we're having, we're actually able now to find some really uh, beautiful sites for Chardonnay and the wine Lingua Franca, the wine in front of you in wine one, is an example of that. That's a, a site in the South Salem Hills which faces uh, directly out to the coast so it gets a nice warming um, afternoon sun but it also sits right in the Van Dusa Corridor which is our major wind influence in the Willamette Valley. And so those grapes in that Bunker Hill vineyard um, are really impacted by that wind influence, which makes the vines, um, the grapes, very small, and they have a higher skin to juice ratio than in other regions, than if they were in a protected site. So what the winemaker, Thomas Savra, really loves about this wine is that there's a really, really big phenolic 
load in this wine and it gives acid and texture and and structure to this wine that he doesn't have to then build in by the use of oak or lees so it's a very you know naturally well structured site for chardonnay and this is 100 percent dijon clone 76 planted in 1997 so it's got some nice vine age to it um, and it's only a single clone but it's planted on its own roots um, and is really more impacted by its weather influences in that specific site than it is necessarily about the clonal influence. So a really interesting wine. This is um, Lingua Franca is Larry Stone um, MS's um, winery and um, Dominic Lafon is a consulting winemaker there as well. Um, so we do have some Southern Oregon uh, Chardonnay but it tends to be a little more richer and opulent and there's not a lot planted down there so we are really focusing today on just the Willamette Valley and on the Columbia Valley for the couple of wines um, that we've got in front of you. Um, I'll let Cameron talk about Chardonnay in New Zealand before we jump into the Bethel Heights as well and we can jump back and forth um, yeah. as we taste the wines together. All right I just want to touch on Chardonnay in terms of um, clones because there's really only three to remember and that is um, the Mendoza clone which uh, really forms uh, a lot of the plantings in New Zealand but that's now segued uh, in more recent times into clone 95 and clone 96. Wine number two that you're trying, which is the Nudorf wine, is 100% Mendoza. So it has a particular flavor profile or a particular aromatic profile. Um, hopefully you can pick up on that a little bit, which in, for my palate, it tends more towards that California peach um, characteristic. In terms of the way in which this wine is made, I'll, I'll get to in a second. But as I mentioned earlier, all wine regions in New Zealand produce Chardonnay. The, Auckland wine region, which is really quite clay-based. There is all of that volcanic material from um, eons ago that um, form part of the subsoil, but it really is clay. So when you get a producer like Cumu River, and I know they had a tasting here in New York yesterday, site selection is the most important thing for them. And also the vine training system that they use, which is not your typical VSP, although it is vertical shoot in the end. It's a Lyra system because it has to cope with disease pressure and airflow is very, very important. Um, powdery mildew is perhaps um, something that New Zealand faces in, in recent times and when it's very dry Indian summers, that powdery mildew does increase. For a producer like Cumu River, it gives us more hen and chicken berries. Um, that is an advantage to them um, when you walk through their vineyard uh, in um, growing season time, you'll see why. As you move further south through New Zealand, you get more volcanic um, derived materials closer to the surface. So when you get to a place like Gisborne, you get more clay gravel mixes. And then there's a lot of silty loams over the top of that when you come down into the Wairarapa area, um, which is the Greater Wellington province. Limestone starts to appear with gravels and clays. You jump across to the South Island where um, this producer is, Nelson uh, and Nudorf, 100% Mendoza clone. This is 100% whole bunch press wine for you and is 100% um, wild ferment and high solids. So. With screw, tap, screw cap closures, there is the tendency for a little bit of reductiveness, but that should, you know we pour these wines at 9.30, that should have blown off by now. Yeah, I think, you know, talking, I, this is a good example and a good time for us to, you know, start looking at the wines um, together and um, talking about some winemaking similarities and clonal similarities. And just for reference, Mendoza clone is the same clone as Wente here in the state, so it's unheat treated Wente. It was taken south by Harry Olmo um, in the late 70s, and it was actually introduced into Margaret River in Australia first, and it, say, it serves as the backbone to their industry. And then as David Honan took it over to New Zealand, um, where he um, began working, was it Cloudy Bay that mm -hmm. he started? Mm -hmm. um, so that's how that, that clone, Wente, the unheat treated Wente, which is well known for hen and chicken bunches, so um, small unfertilized berries, so very high skin phenolics and high acids compared to you know bigger, juicier grapes. So you get more phenolic content in the wines from 
Mendoza, Wente, and Jinjin, Jin, as they're known in the three countries. Um, so the wines three and four, and two, you said Newdorf is 100% Mendoza? Correct. So wine two and wine four in your glasses um, are both 100% uh, from that clone. Um, wine four being the Bethel Heights from the Eola Amity Hills in Oregon. Um, and that also is, um, this is one of the original plantings um, planted in 1978 in the Eola Amity Hills. And it's um, old Wente clone trained on a high wire, so that California sprawl sort of training. So high wire training. Um, and and really trying to maximize getting some of that those yields up on these bunches that can be very hen and chicken and so you're getting very reduced yields and then coming back to wine one and two in that combination the you know the difference between wine one being clone 76 is that it being on a windy site it gets those hen and chicken bunches from being f damaged through flowering and so having the fruit set damaged there during that wind um, activation that hits the vineyard during flowering gives it a similar disease problem as Mendoza or Wente has. So when you're looking at the two wines, one and two, the Lingua Franca and the Newdorf, you're seeing those reductive notes coming through um, because of the winemaking primarily. Mm. And you're also getting the phenolic texture on the wine because they've both been from hen and chicken um, bunches in the vineyard. And I know um, Thomas Savra the winemaker at Lingua Franca, um, goes very dirty to barrel. So meaning that they don't settle overnight and take only the cool juice off the top of the tank. Um, they actually take, they stir everything up, they whole bunch of, whole cluster press the grapes, it goes into the press, it goes into a tank, and it goes straight into barrel from there. So it goes very dirty mm. to barrel, like uh, Cameron was saying with Newdorf. And so you're getting um, more lees impact. And the impact of lees in barrel is that it scavenges oxygen. So lees feeds itself by scavenging oxygen, and that can create reduction. And, and that's the style in France and in Lingua Franca and in Newdorf. And so it's not a screw cap issue. It's a, you know, this is a very stylistic choice decision made in the winery. Um, and so I find, you know, I think these wines are just perfectly paired together. And um, Newdorf is one of my favorite producers in New Zealand as well, you know, a beautiful family. And again, really influenced by that cool ocean Im influence as well as being Mendoza clone. Incidentally, the, the wine number two is French oak, moderate percentage new. Incidentally, it's a fully um, certified organic site. Incidentally, I guess as well, the time spent on lees is a whole year and then some four extra months on fine lees as well. So it kind of, the, the impact of that and for me that, that spice, that fine texture um, producing you know, to me, similar wines, just different weight weight ratios, uh, are great examples of what's happening in terms of um, Nelson and um, with the Lingua Franca and the Willamette. So, any questions or comments on these two wines as a pair? I mean, it's it's a style, definitely. It's moving. No one no one really does batonnage on Chardonnay anymore. No one wants that big, buttery, opulent. You know, when you introduce all of that oxygen, um, especially on wines that go through malolactic fermentation. So wine one has gone through 100% um, malolactic fermentation. If you're stirring the lees and bringing in a lot of oxygen very quickly and stirring up all of those sugars at the same time, um, the malolactic conversion is going to be a little different and bringing in some of that diacetyl um, pop, buttered popcorn character. And so nobody really wants that in their wines. They want more purity. And the reduction that, that comes from the winemaking will start to fade over time, but it's at the moment supporting that fruit that's there. Um, these are fairly young wines being, you know, 2016 and 2017. Um, what that reduction serves for 
is to give longevity in the bottle and in the cellar. Um, and that's, you know, I guess a reference more to how they have always traditionally made wine in Burgundy. Yeah. It, it's definitely a trend. <laughs> and it's a trend that <laughs> seems to be a positive one because the reaction in, in terms of the Somalia community in Australasia that I've seen and definitely parts of um, the US uh, has been positive. And the answer to reduction, if you don't like it, is decant. Just yeah. decant it. And, and it will fix the problem for you. Yeah, introducing oxygen. You know, it's the same during the winemaking process when you, you know, rack and return is, is introducing some oxygen to get rid of that reduction. So you can certainly decant white wines. Mm. But, and especially in their youth when they are tightly wound. Absolutely. But certainly style preferences. And then the Kumau River. Oh, I'm going to correct you there. Kumu. 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 It's like Kumu. Kumu. <laughs> I live about 20 minutes from this vineyard, and um, certainly driving into this area, as I explained before, in terms of um, climatic conditions, soil type, this is unique in terms of a site for Auckland because it used to be classified as rural and now it's um, almost urban and um, so the vineyards are having to deal with um, um, exhaust fumes from trucks and cars every day but it seems to manage that pretty well. This is all about 100% 100% barrel fermentation, 100% malolactic fermentation, um, indigenous yeast again and in fact all the Kumu River wines regardless of grape variety are made exactly the same way. All 100% all the way through. Uh, and all of the wines in front of you are um, indigenous ferments as well from Oregon at the moment, um, which is generally a standard practice in Oregon. Um, there are some people who inoculate uh, with you know, certain styles of yeast, but most fermentations start off naturally and then they'll inoculate as the ferment is going through, depending on the, um, how quickly they want it to ferment or how quickly other mm. fruits coming in as well. Um, the Bethel Heights, again, I mentioned, is the old Wente clone. Volcanic soils in this area, so Nakaya soils, and again, impacted by the Van Duza Corridor, but not as heavily as Wine One, the Bunker Hill. Um, and again, this goes into 30% new French oak barrel. Um, and 2015, so it's starting to get some age and flesh out a little bit. In its youth, it had more of, that, of the reduction notes that you see in the New Dorf and the Lingua Franca, and it's starting to flesh out in barrel. Hmm. And now the next two wines, next three wines, let's look at the next three as a whole. Um, so you're going to notice something a little bit different about uh, the Hayu wine, wine five. This is the Columbia Gorge wine. This is a wine that's made by Nate Reddy, uh, who's a master sommelier. Uh, he actually, has an entire farm that he uh, grows all of the food on. He grows his biodynamic preparations on. Um, the vineyards are interplanted. They're a mixture of old vines and new vines, grafted and non. Uh, and this uh, is actually not 100% pure Chardonnay. This is called Falcon Box White. And this vineyard is actually a massive selection of Burgundian uh, white varieties, so mixed clonal plantings of Chardonnay, and also Pinot Gris, Pinot Blanc, and Aligote um, are all ha hand harvested together and co-fermented. Everything is done naturally at this winery. Um, they use a basket press, not a bladder press, for even the white wines. So you're picking up some of that phenolic character and some slight oxidation notes because of that slow process of basket pressing as opposed to bladder pressing. Um, it then goes to barrel and is allowed to naturally ferment for however long it takes to ferment. Sometimes it takes two years to finish to dryness. I, I notice all the tannins in that wine. Yeah. I mean, the, the texture of that wine is very significant, and I don't know what the popularity of a wine um, of that color, that style, that texture is in, in, in the state area here and even across the ditch there and um, there. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but it's certainly a style that needs um, to be taken seriously, I think, as well, simply because of um, uh, 
um, we get to we, we get the benefit of the experiment, if you like, and as much as you're getting the benefit of the experiment today, just in terms of um, what skin contact can actually do for Chardonnay, a little bit's actually okay, even even as a blend like this. The Nautilus is uh, quite a different wine, and you'll notice um, you know, its power and impact on the nose. It's only 20% new French oak in here, and it uses a clone called Clone 15, which I didn't mention earlier, but I think that's chosen because of the super coolness of the Marlborough wine region. Um, Nautilus is known, uh, in addition to Chardonnay, for its sparkling wine production. So I think this, the clonal material here um, has an impact and input on that sparkling wine. Like a lot of the wines today, it's hand harvest, a lot of whole bunch um, press going on, but you'll see, uh, or hopefully you'll see and feel a much smoother satin texture in this wine, and the oak has um, underpins this wine in terms of some of that structure, but not all of it. I think that's a really interesting, you know, if we were maybe tasting these wines 10 years ago or 15 years ago, I think they would be very different styles. And so I think that what Cameron mentioned about, you know, the skin contact, skin contact and phenolics. I mean, phenolics was a dirty word, you know, in, in mm. winemaking. Um, and so I think now winemakers are not so afraid of phenolics and in fact appreciate that it brings some structural element that they maybe, maybe don't have to spend on oak barrels to get that additional structure and flavor into the wine. And so I think as people want to, or as winemakers want to explore more the purity of the grape variety and of their place, they're actually a little more comfortable with a longer press cycle, more whole cluster, not so much fining, you know, a lot of these wines are unfined, um, you know, that you don't need to over-stabilize, over-fine, you don't need to strip out all of the character of the wine because you're stripping away the essence of the grape and the place. And I think that's what's the exciting thing about winemaking today is that we've removed, we've gone from being purely technical and being afraid of having, you know, anything that's not purely bright and clear and sparkly and and doesn't slip down the throat you know very easily to having things that have tension and structure and you know al dante-ness on the palate that that give interest to our palate and i think that we're seeing this in all of these wines today and i think that really happens when you're working with small producers small growers who are getting to know their sites and their places more intimately. It's a maturing of a wine industry, which is what I think we're seeing mostly in front of us. I think from working the floor from a sommelier's perspective that we, we know we have a certain percentage of our audience that are Chablis fans, that are California Chardonnay fans, and that when, once we understand those two things about them and um, given the opportunity to take them somewhere else, that with the, with the lineup of wine so far today, I am looking for that alternative to Chablis. I am looking for that alternative to you know, what is ordered a lot um, off wine lists. And they have their place and they generate a lot of money. But this is saying, l let's take this to the next stage. Let's uh, open their eyes and their palates to what else can be done. And often, you know, not talking money, but at a cheaper price point as well. And so we, we, we love those buyers, but we want to take them on that journey as well. And I think just those first six wine take us there. Number seven is a jump back to the traditional, <laughs> I would say. The, this is a no holds barred style wine. In Hawke's Bay, this is the last producer to pick their Chardonnay every single year. When everybody's done and dusted, 10 days later, Clearview Estate Wines harvest their Chardonnay. They just let it hang, hang, hang. And there's about 1% residual sugar in here, and that's pushed along quite a bit, I think, from the new oak component here, which is it's not shy of doing anything. Yeah, it's kind of got everything in that glass, doesn't it? It's, <laughs> it's, it's loaded. Yeah. This wine is loaded. But it's not too high in alcohol. It's only 13.5 alcohol. It's got that big, rich, round character that, you know, that popcorn component that you were talking about before certainly comes through. 
and but this is the mouth filling reserve style of Clearview Estate. It's a nice kernel character. It's not necessarily a sweetness or a you know a you know opulent vanilla sweet buttery character that comes. There's a more savory you know nature to the to the wine as well, yeah. which I think you know is really complementary to all of what's going in there. Yeah, this is super small in terms of production. Small batches of Chardonnay harvested from uh, a coastal site, and some of you might pick up on that salinity um, on on the palate. There is a slight saltiness that is there. And what else did I want to say about that? Um, small producer, lots of different um, oak, and it's all about the blending. Final comment about this wine is that outside the box of recipe wine making for Chardonnay, a portion of this wine reaches 30 degrees um, Celsius. Whatever Blows that off all those primary. Yeah, yeah, boom. So it gets very hot part of that ferment and then they pull it back in again. So it can show you that Chardonnay fruit can withstand the pressures of winemaking. Yeah, as opposed to be, you know, typically white wine making is a you know lower cooler temperatures to preserve the fruit profile and that's when you tend to get some of those lemon drop and sort of pineapple jelly sort of characters coming through uh, if you let the ferments get warmer which is why all of these producers you know ferment in barrel without temperature control um, is is when you start getting you know more of the interest and savoriness and and place instead of um, wine making and and confected grape Chardonnay in New Zealand, just as a final comment before we move into some red wine, is very traditional in terms of um, open vats, straight to barrel is an option. The idea of using eggs is new but established. So there are a couple of producers that are now um, um, buying concrete eggs made in New Zealand and using them. Who here has... Um New Zealand Chardonnay on their shelf or wine list. Okay, so it's definitely a category. And what about Oregon? And that's, yeah, increasing? Yeah, so I, I mean, I think we see both of these regions bringing more uh, premium quality Chardonnay to the table and, and we're going to see continued presence in the market of these styles of Chardonnay, yeah. um, especially as the trade catches on to them. Questions, comments? Likes, dislikes. Can I ask you a marketing related question? Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, New Zealand is well known for producing winemaking overall. Um, are you seeing wines in New Zealand similar to wine number five in this flight, or is, it, uh, is that not yet a. Oh, no, that, that, that is something that is. Um, quietly practiced. Some, some of these wines are released, but they're not something that is um, exported. And I think it's because we're still trying to find really where we sit in terms of that. If it's a, a, a single producer experiment, um, that they, they simply don't do the volume, frankly. And we would prefer those wines to be sold and drunk locally at home first. And I think you'll find more of that style coming out of Pinot Gris from New Zealand before Chardonnay. Yeah, I think you see that in Australia as well. You know, there's you know that all of there's such small producers and small production that's making wine styles like this, and you even see it in Oregon as well. The smaller producers who are making um, wines like that with skin contact and in amphora, there's very few of them that are actually getting out of the marketplace because they're small, and then they're all snapped up by the local market. You st you do see them in major cities like New York and Chicago, and but it's still a very small part of the market. All the New Zealand wines are under Stelvin. Yeah. yeah. All in the Chardonnays. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think it's the age. Yeah. 
age. I think that was the age, and that's a good Sorry. example of those that those reductive characters, you know, dissipating over time and resolving into yeah. the wine. But for for the short term, they keep the wine fresh. It's the same as what the lees do in the barrel, which is you know sca scavenge oxygen and then keep it really tight and fresh. And then with time, they flesh out and become yeah you know more palatable. Yeah, if you take a a, a, a perfect cork, a perfect cork, which is Rare, <laughs> well, at least just say a perfect cork uh, and uh, a screw top disc that sits on the top of the bottle. Um, the research shows that there is no more ingress of oxygen through either. The, the, the ingress is the same. So it's actually about protecting the juice from um, something that is less than perfect uh, as a closure. So you should find the same result as a vino lock, a glass stopper. Um, if that was used with these wines, you'd probably find the same result. Um, because the ingress of oxygen is infinitesimal, really, at the end of the day. Yeah. And there was a question up the back as well. I'm not sure. Definitely. Ooh, that is a really good question. I think if I was being truthful, I'd say the demand for New Zealand Chardonnay is increasing and we're only just keeping up with it, I think. And like you suggest, it's, it's when new plantings come online and w where those plantings can actually take place. I, you know, in New Zealand, for example, central Otago really is the new destination for Chardonnay plantings. We can't plant it fast enough down there because it's very popular. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I would say similarly in, in Oregon, uh, definitely increasing, definitely in demand in the local market. Um, I think that the national market um, and international markets are only starting to get a taste of what new Oregon Chardonnay is tasting like. Um, and so from the demand that we've seen um, for the styles that are now coming out, um, there's definitely demand in the marketplace. Um, again, it's that, I guess, the quality and style for, for what you're making. Um, but in terms of a domestic, a domestic local market, there's definitely an interest, um, increased interest. And, and in our major, I mean, New York's our major market nationally, and, and we're seeing a lot of interest in, in Oregon Chardonnay here. Um, Lingua Franca, Walter Scott, you know, Bethel Heights, all of those um, sort of icon producers, Adelsheim. Um, I mean, the commercial reality yeah. is for New Zealand anyway, is that we, we must make an export Sauvignon Blanc. That is um, the backbone of our industry. But very, very um, close behind that in terms of curiosity and interest are the Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, maybe some of the Gamay you're about to try. Um, not competing, but just growing the story for us in international markets. So your feedback and, and your curiosity for these wines on your programs, whether it's in a restaurant or retail, it doesn't matter. We need to, we need to know where that interest lies so that we can help you get exposed to more of these examples. Yeah, where the style lies for that. French oak. All French oak. Yeah. All barriques, all French oak. There's a couple of punchins uh, that are that are in the mix, but um, it's primarily barrique French oak. Yeah. Uh, Lingua Franca use use I think three punchins, uh, so you're getting more surface area to wine than oak contact there. And I would say as a trend, we're starting to see more punchins in use, um, and definitely more neutral barrel um, inclusion. Most. Oregon Chardonnay producers, I would say, would now use around 10 to 15 percent new oak maximum um, in their Chardonnay, and that even flows through a little into the Pinot Noir now, but definitely in the Chardonnay, it's not about an oak impact, it's more about that time on lees um, and the very natural long fermentation and nat natural long malolactic fermentation that occurs in oak. Um, so it's more about the chemistry of the wine in barrel than it is about the barrel itself, if that makes sense. Same story in New Zealand as well. Mm -hmm. um, 
we seeing an increase in um, fooders coming into New Zealand. So there are one or two producers that are just bringing in you know, a dozen at a time because of their volume increase. So food a barrel for sure, French for sure, and the odd cigar barrel um, <laughs> is finding its way um, to New Zealand. So, yeah. Which gives greater Lee's contact. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, you had a question. So, so <clears throat> to be more in the Yeah, I'm not sure that it's um, anti-California so so much. Yeah, I you know, really, I think it's more about a maturing of the industry, and that you know has you know coincided with um, Dijon clones that were brought in in the late '80s, um, finally getting some vine age, and and really you know we're a dry grown region, we don't have irrigation, so the vine roots go very deep. Um, and so I think in those early years, um, you, you're not really sure what the vine can do, but once it gets some vine age, um, we're starting to see those Dijon clones uh, really performing well. And then on top of that, we're also finding that the industry is now you know, in its second and third generation, and people are um, understanding the complexities of site. And so they're not just planting Chardonnay as an afterthought and then making it how you know, they were taught to make it in Davis or Fresno, um, and and they're actually you know making it how how it it is supposed to be made in and that has a lot of Burgundian influence, but it's also more mostly about the site and the clonal material that we're now getting. So I I wrap all of that into a maturing of the industry along with the maturing of, of understanding Chardonnay and our clones and our sites. I think there is ready. Okay. We're gonna Taste jump into <laughs> we're gonna jump into Gamay really quickly. Can I get you to dump your whites and then um, we'll dump the yeah. Gamays as well? But we've got two Gamays in front of you. Um, so Gamay is a great variety that's really increasing um, in Oregon. And I say that you know sort of tongue in cheek, being that there's maybe 50 acres planted at most, and a lot of that is grafted across from. Pinot Noir that has maybe been planted in the wrong place so it doesn't perform as well. And we're grafting across to Gamay Noir. Um, Gamay Noir is a grape variety. Um, obviously, it's having a lot of success and a trend moment um, at the moment in the you know on-premise and um, off-trade marketplace. Um, it's fruity, it's delicious, it's spicy. You know, you can drink it generally every day of the week because it's affordable. Um, but we're also finding that in in Oregon, that as a grape variety, it's actually um, you know performing. Uh, more economically from a farming perspective, we're getting higher tons per acre from Gamay Noir and it naturally retains its acidity as well. So we're not worried about it losing, you know, taking a acid dump when it's starting to ripen. So the, the Gamay that I have in front of you is um, the Brickhouse Estate Gamay. This is a biodynamic producer in Ribbon Ridge. So 100% sedimentary Willa Kenzie soils. Um, Doug Tunnell is um, uh, an amazing man who uh, ever, he was a, a war reporter for CNN and um, CBS. when CBS, when he returned to, um, and you as a C, um, when he returned to the US, he, you know, he just wanted to take his um, piece of property and farm and, you know, uh, really reconnect with with um, his place and the soil, and so he planted a mixed vineyard of Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, and Gamay Noir, uh, and he uh, fell in love with the Gamays of Beaujolais when he had been working in the region um, and working in Europe over there, and uh, he was very instrumental in bringing in the um, proprietary Entav clone of 358 Gamay Noir, which is a Grand Cru selection clone. The Generally, the other clones of Gamay that we've had brought into the US are more high production clones. So they're not necessarily always the most detailed or finessed wines that you get from them. And then, of course, there's a couple of 
non-gametes um, that have, have been planted as well. So Val de Guay in California, um, and we have in Oregon Beaujolais gamay, which is actually a clone of Pinot Noir. So there's a few misnomers of gamay um, out there, but now that the real gamay or true gamay has, has arrived, um, it's really taking some spotlight in Oregon and performing really well. And it's mostly the younger producers, the younger winemakers, along with Doug Tennell, who's a pioneer of the industry, um, who are, who are you know, really gravitating towards Gamay because it's more affordable for them to buy. They don't need to put it in a lot of oak. In fact, some of the Gamays that you're seeing in the marketplace don't see any oak. They can be made in a variety of styles. Um, and so it's a really you know, entry point to an Oregon market for a lot of consumers and also for a lot of these young producers. Um, they can actually afford to make it and get started with it. So um, this wine for me is just absolutely stunning. It's about 30%, no, 20% whole cluster um, and 358 clone, which is my favorite clone of, of Gamay Noir. Um, very perfumed. You get the that really um, quintessential uh, ruby red grapefruit character, which comes from wines, uh, red wines grown on the uh, Ribbon, red, Ribbon Ridge Hill um, from those Willa Kenzie soils. So very perfumed, um, but very exciting Gamay Noir um, that's coming out of our state. Quick question, how yep. many producers of um, Gamay style mm -hmm. wine or Gamay wine would you say are in Oregon? Uh, there's about 30 producers now. So a lot of them are just making a ton or two. Right. Uh, I think um, the New Zealand story for Gamay Noir is very small by comparison and less than less than a half dozen producers uh, and of those three are probably prominent and the Timata estate that you're trying here is the more traditional producer of Gamay in New Zealand. The other two or three that I can think of are more barrel fermented styles, biodynamic um, grown fruit, uh, alternative, quote unquote alternative, and very nice wines all the same. But we wanted to show you something here that touches on a lot of tradition. 45% of this fruit is um, carbonic maceration, 55% is not. There are 11 weeks in very old French oak for this wine. So it's not about the oak flavor at all. It's all about structure uh, and aromatics. And I think what I really like about these two wines side by side is you can smell Oregon in the first one and you can smell New Zealand in the, in, in the other one as much as this variety can um, carry those kinds of messages. I think that the Timata Estate one is more about that crunchy cranberry kind of um, characteristic and that red Christmas cherry characteristic. There's a little bit of that bubble gum in there as well, which I like. That's carbonic for you. <laughs> Has anyone had any Oregon Gamay before? Yeah, so it's getting out there. Mm. Yeah. Oh, uh, same. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic wine. <laughs> Just whilst these wines are being poured, and just a, a sort of a summary comment about New Zealand uh, in terms of its wine industry. The modern era of New Zealand wine is really from 19, the very early 1970s up until today. So really what are we talking about here? We're talking close to 50 years, but in that time frame, a rapid understanding of our climate, a rapid understanding of site selection, a rapid understanding of uh, predictability in terms of seasons, rainfall, uh, what we can do to work the soil, and the quiet but um, rapid increase also of uh, organic work in vineyards, the biodynamic story. It tends to be more incidental than certified, but it's certainly happening. There's a lot of people practicing um, farming that um, they're not necessarily interested in being certified, but those practices are taking place. I think the same is, is I mean, Oregon has just passed its 50th anniversary in terms of uh, grape growing and production. Um, you would definitely say that the bulk of, of production has, you know, the early pioneers planted in the 70s, 
um, late 60s and 70s. But then the next generation that really came in in the uh, you know late 90s, mid to late 90s, um, and so we've got a lot of knowledge coming together as well as a maturing of Vine Age. Um, and also, you know, really social sustainability practices coming into our vineyards as well, um, as well as environmental stewardship. You know, it was, um, we in the 1970s, there was a Senate bill passed in Oregon to, prote to protect agricultural land from uh, urban development. So a really conscious, conscious effort made in, in protecting those environments. And that also relates back to our culture of the average Oregon producer has about 20 acres to farm. The 80% of our industry is less than 5,000 cases production. So there's 750 producers in Oregon, but they're all under 5,000 cases, or the bulk of them are under 5,000 cases. You know, it's that 80-20 rule that, that always seems to occur. And I think that with small production and small estate farming and small winemaking, when, when the winemaker is the viticulturist and vice versa, and you have your children in the field with you, um, there's a very natural movement towards environmentalism and sustainability. And so that's why there's such a high level of biodynamic producers in our industry. And the same with Cameron, you know, as, as a New Zealand, there is a lot of producers that are not even certified that are practicing biodynamics or organics or beyond both of those. Um, you know, Mimi Castile is uh, one of the children of the one of the pioneers of the industry at Bethel Heights and you know practice has developed her own farming methods which is you know heavily based around vermiculture and um, uh, more than biodynamics so there's you know pioneering efforts in in sustainability and in environmentalism that happen in Oregon um, and you know live certification was one of those um, sustainable efforts that occurred before any sustainable efforts had happened in California or Washington oh, we've lost signal power oh, turn down. I think there's a strong relationship between um, the wine growing communities of New Zealand and Oregon for at least the last 25 if not 30 years that I'm aware of and it's the exchange of understanding and I think Pinot Noir has been driving that where um, uh, in Oregon for example winemakers are beginning to have workshops where they're showing each other their wines and finding out um, how to improve what they're doing that's something that's been practiced in New Zealand for a long time and then when you take that internationally then um, the, the, the natural partnership I think between New Zealand and Oregon with Pinot Noir um, one gentleman who would have um, fathered the escarpment wine here Larry McKenna um, um, has helped build those um, relationships over the last 20 years that I'm aware of so um, Pinot and not that we're trying to make similar wines but we're trying to make wines that reflect exactly what the soil and environment are showing us. And the, I mean, we don't tend to use the word terroir in New Zealand, but we, we are trying to use it more in, in terms of explaining what's going on. Uh, because it is a combination of um, cultural influences as much as, much as it is winemaking material and people. All right. Sure. Uh, the question was pest diseases, what pressure comes um, to our vineyards in New Zealand? First of all, uh, I think the number one um, disease pressure uh, on an annual basis is probably botrytis and I think that that is controlled uh, extremely well. It depends on the size of the producer and sometimes it just can't be avoided and there are some producers who might embrace a little bit of botrytis in their wine. I can think of a couple but essentially we avoid it at all costs if, if, if that's the case. I think the mealybug um, is something that there is no 
cure for, and it's a replanting program, and it, it you know it crops up um, where we don't expect it to. So mealybug um, uh, and spreading leaf roll virus is basically the virus that it spreads. Yeah. Uh, what else? Powdery mildew, as I mentioned before. Um, it's in its sexual phase at the moment, if I can be R18 for that uh, at the moment. And so it, if we have an El Nino um, summer, uh, which we're currently having, then it becomes a little bit more challenging for us. But I would say that would be the top three. And um, every, everything is controllable. It just depends on your approach and whether you are reactive or proactive for that. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's isolated, and I think it would be a rootstock um, replacement for that. I know of one producer that uses olive oil and honey as a spray on their vineyard, and it suppresses botrytis extremely well. It doesn't, doesn't come along. Sure. Yes. There, uh, with the exception of, oh, I would say across the whole country, a hectare, a hectare at most. Yeah, there are there is the odd vineyard that is still on route on its own roots. There are in Alexandra and um, Central Otago. There are some very sandy soils, and um, that's where you would find the odd vineyard that's still on its own roots. But essentially, it, 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 we're a grafting nation. <laughs> yeah, we have to do it. Pinot Noir. Pinot Noir from Oregon. From Oregon, yes. So. As everyone knows, Pinot Noir is Oregon's grape variety, red grape variety. We are definitely committed to Pinot Noir. 58% of our production is Pinot Noir. That has dropped in recent years. So it used to be just a couple of years ago what that number was in the 70s and then 60s, and now it's 58%. So what that tells you is that there are many other regions in Oregon that are starting to plant other varieties and are starting to expand. So it's not, no longer just the Willamette Valley in southern Oregon that are focused on Pinot Noir. They're also looking at other grape varieties as well, as we saw in the Gamay Noir previous and you'll see in our, this afternoon session. But Pinot Noir we are still devoted to and I think we're at you know, a, an exciting time for Pinot Noir in that we know where Pinot Noir performs incredibly well. We know the style of wines that we're going to get off of the sandy sedimentary Willakenzi soils and the styles of wines that we're going to get off the volcanic soils in Jory soils, the Dundee soils, and the Nakaya soil series in Eola Amity. Um, and they're becoming very distinctive. And so we're seeing planties expand in all of those northern Willamette AVAs, especially in the Eola Amity Hills where there's still plantable land. Um, the Dundee Hills is almost planted out. You know, you're, you're looking at very expensive land if there's anything left in, in the Dundee Hills. Um, but more volcanic areas are available in um, McMinnville AVA and also in the Dundee Hills. Uh, sorry, in the Eola Amity Hills. So the wines that we have today are coming from the nested AVAs of the northern Willamette Valley, of which there are seven nested AVAs. These are going to expand as well. The newest AVA, the Van Dusa Corridor AVA, um, was recently um, just put through in January this year. And there'll be a number of other AVAs that are starting to come online um, within the next few years that are currently in final approval stages with the TTB. So one is also based around a soil series called Laurelwood, which is based in the Shehalem Mountains. Um, and so that's a very fine loose soil, um, which is sort of degraded, windblown basalts. Um, very fine. It gives wines that are very perfumed and very pristine and very pretty. Um, the sedimentary Willakenzie soil series tends to give wines that are more broad and approachable and opulent on the palate and more accessible, easy on. And then the volcanic soil series are that you know high-toned or dark-fruited, um, very structured style. Jewelry soils um, have more of that spice and red, um, red candy, red pepper, red licorice, um, red spice flavors coming through. And down to the Eola Amity Nokia soil series, which are very savory, um, you know, 
very, very dark oolong tea uh, flavors coming through in those wines. And those wines are also buffered by the Van Dusen Corridor winds. So climatic wind conditions do also, you know, play a role in those um, regions as well. Um, so committed to Pinot Noir, it is continuing to grow. So this number continues to grow. We're just also seeing an expansion in other grape varieties as well. Um, we do have essentially what I call the Oregon clones uh, for Pinot Noir, which um, really was what David Lett and Charles Curie, who planted um, the vineyards, um, brought into the AVA in 1965. So those um, Oregon clones are Vadensville, which is a Swiss clone that was also brought over from Switzerland by that amazing Harry Olmo, viticultural doctor um, from UC Davis. So he brought that um, Vadensville clone across to the US in the 1960s and uh, David Adels, uh, sorry, David Adels, David Lett brought it north to Oregon and planted it in the Dundee Hills. He also planted with Vadensville, Pomard, and it was Pomard number two, which was the um, less reliable and lower yielding clone of Pomard that also came across with Olmo at that time. And so that was from Pomard in Burgundy and David Lett brought that north and planted that also. So those are the two main grape varieties that are really the backbone of the Oregon industry and they are very distinctive in their flavor and style profile. Vadensville being very red fruited, high toned, perfumed, high in acid, very um, ethereal and pretty, and pomard being the sort of structured frame, the earth, um, the tea leaf, the savoriness from pomard fits just perfectly with the uh, fruity, perfumed nature and high acid nature of Vadensville. So those are the two main clones. There weren't any other clones brought into Oregon until the late 80s, and those were the Dijon clones. I call them Oregon Heritage or Oregon Heirloom clones because those two varieties, those two clones of Pinot Noir are not planted anywhere else in the US or anywhere else in the world in such a pair in to uh, such plantings. You know, California had their heritage clones, which they really stuck to. No one planted Vadensville. It was too early ripening and no one planted the lower yielding pomard, they're farmers, they go for the higher yielding stuff. So the pomard and Vadensville that are in Oregon are very, very unique to Oregon and to the flavor profile on the wines that you see in Oregon. <clears throat> uh, in the late 80s, then came the Dijon clones, so 667 and 777, which are you know earlier ripening, 114, 115, all of those perfumed, pretty florals, earlier ripening, tend to take on sugar more reliably. So they became a you know, backbone to the industry in the 90s because they were reliable. And so that's when you see from the 90s onwards is when you start to see Dijon plantings occurring in vineyards along with Pomard and Vadensville because no one wants to leave behind what you already know is a good thing, right? In, in you know, the 1970s, David let you know, beat the French basically in, in a Pinot Noir taste off which is why you know, Robert Drouin came and planted Domaine Drouin in the late 70s, early 80s. So this, this is you know, a, a historical moment that you know, we're really attaching to these two clones of Pinot Noir for distinctiveness. So we have, um, can we get, we're missing two of the wines as well. Marie, can we get wine two and wine six that Cameron and I are missing, sorry. Cool. Um, so there, that's the Oregon Pinot Noir story in a nutshell. Influenced by the major soils, sedimentary, Willikensi, volcanic, Nakaya, and Jory. Influenced by the coastal influence of the, of the wind coming through that Van Dusa corridor to lower the powdery mildew pressure um, and give thick skins um, and disease-free fruit. And then finally, the clonal material. All right, the New Zealand Pinot Noir story is as interesting, but perhaps not as complex as the one that you've just heard. And the first clone really to mention, which um, um, really formed a lot of what happened in the New Zealand Pinot Noir scene was called the Abel clone. 
and the Abel clone is named after a gentleman called Malcolm Abel, who happened to be a wine enthusiast but worked for the DSIR, which is essentially the person who might go through your luggage at the airport, and, um, and discovered somebody had brought in some cuttings um, in their suitcase and were duly confiscated, but they were not destroyed. And this clone is said to have come from DRC. And so that was picked up by a number of producers in the Wairarapa in particular. So the Atarangi of this world, um, the dry rivers of this world, um, producers um, have this material and then it's spread. It's not the first story of pen and wire in New Zealand, which is from the 1800s, but this is certainly the modern story. Like Oregon, we then developed our clonal material coming through um, quarantine stations that were really the Dijon clones, the 667s, the 777s, more recently the 114s, 115s, all right, just in terms of numbers. So a clone is a clone is a clone, but the whether it is um, mass selection planted in our vineyards or individual clone plantings in our vineyards should and does make a difference to what you are tasting and therefore what is blended into the final juice. As you can see on screen here, we don't have quite as much planted across the country, but this is a number that is increasing in part because of the popularity of Pinot Noir overall, both nationally for us and internationally in terms of exports, but also the material that is going into sparkling wine production is on the rise. And so, like I mentioned before, alluded to before, we want to try you a couple of New Zealand sparkling wines later on where Pinot Noir does have a voice in there. In terms of soil types, really what we're looking at today, even though I mentioned that we do grow Pinot Noir throughout the country, we're looking at the wider app of the Greater Wellington area. And these soil uh, influences here um, do have limestone. There is clay. There is older sedimentary rock under this. There is some gravels. So we are getting wines from the wider Napa with um, more strawberry character before you get this deep-seated cherry character. Then, of course, it's winemaking. Uh, in the Marlborough area, a lot more crunchier fruit. These are free-draining soils, you know. Irrigation in New Zealand is a good word. It is a good thing for our industry and, and it helps us control things in drier climates, despite the amount of rain that we do get. In central Otago, it's very different again. Lots of um, um, schist quartz, a little bit of limestone around and lots of wind blown materials. Um, a lot of the areas are carved out from glacial activity um, from um, several millennia ago and we still have that cool, cool, cool um, climate breeze um, blowing through. So that's enough about the New Zealand story. Really it is what's in the glass, what we can taste and tell you about these wines as we work our way through yeah. and we've sort of blocked them, um, Oregon than New Zealand. Yeah, so you've got Oregon in the uh, first uh, five in front of you. So um, let's have a taste through that way and um, we'll walk through and tell you about the wines as we're tasting. So the first wine uh, is the Minimus. It's labeled as Willamette Valley red wine. This is 80% um, Pinot Noir, 10% Gamay Noir, 7% um, Pinot Gris, and 3% Trousseau Noir. So the Pinot Gris is co-fermented in there on its skins and with Gamay Noir as well. Pinot Noir is still 80% of the blend, which is still higher than the federal legal minimum for labeling your wine as Pinot Noir. If you were tasting this wine blind, would you think it was Pinot Noir? So naturally made, wild yeast fermented, uh, unfined, unfiltered. Um, they use the Gamay Noir and the Pinot Gris in this wine as the um, ac acidulation. Uh, because of the um, components of the soils in, in Oregon, um, generally Pinot Noir needs to be acidified in, in Portland, um, in Portland, in Oregon. So, so the soils are very um, high in acid, which has the inverse effect in the wines. Um, so, Gamay Noir is a very natural acidulator 
um, for, for the fruit. So that's why it's used in this um, wine here in um, a fairly natural producer with Minimus wines. Uh, sourced from all over the Willamette Valley, but primarily from the Johan Vineyard in the Van Duzer Corridor, ABA. Uh, the second wine is from Beckham Estate. It's a Pinot Noir that is from Chehalem Mountains. It's from volcanic soils on Chehalem Mountains. The grapes or the vines are about uh, nine years old at the moment. Uh, and this producer, actually, he's a um, high school uh, ceramicist, and uh, he makes his own uh, amphora. So he was reading an article one day about um, Elisabetta Foradori and uh, was like, hey, I make clay vessels every day of my life and I have a vineyard and I make wine. Why aren't I doing this? And so he studied and um, did many, many prototypes and um, actually worked with um, Chad Stock from Minimus Wines to make the first wines in Amphora so that they could um, play around with how, you know, what the, com what the blend needed to be, how um, thick the Amphora needed to be, how heavy, how hard it needed to be fired. Uh, and he now has a business producing Oregon Amphora, which um, an increasing number of producers in Oregon are using. So this wine is unique texturally um, from that amphora influence. So this is whole cluster fermented, 100% whole cluster fermented in amphora, um, hand plunged, fermented to dryness or almost dryness in amphora. It's pressed and then goes back into the amphora um, for aging for generally for seven to eight months. No oak whatsoever, only amphora. Again, native ferment as well, and low sulfur only at Botterley. It's very perfumed, isn't it? It's you know, it doesn't have a lot of savoriness to it. It's very perfumed, very soft. What happens with M4 in the tannins is that really resolved tannin happens very early in life. You're not waiting around for it to become resolved as you do as you're waiting for tannins in oak barrels. Um, and you know, some of that woodiness of the oak also contribute to the um, palate profile. It gives that sanguine sort of like you just bit your lip sort of iron ferrous character as well, which I find quite appealing. Um, so it's a fun wine. And just to bring you know, that to your attention, that now some producers in Oregon are actually purchasing these amphora and making these as part of their blend for their estate wines. So they'll have some of the wine fermented in amphora or aged in amphora, some of it fermented and aged in wood, some of it fermented and aged in concrete. Um, but there's a lot of experimentation happening as we you know, return to more of these historical and natural styles of winemaking that we, you know, we used to be um, only have access to. Uh, Walter Scott Wines is the, is the next uh, Pinot Noir. So this is primarily Dijon clones from the Eola Amity Hills. This is from Sojourner Vineyard um, in the Amity Hills. And it is a west-facing site um, that uh, also is uh, affected by the Van Duza Corridor. Um, Ken Paolo, um is the winemaker for this and uh, his wife runs the business and sales. Um, it's a small family production. They do less than 6,000 cases. They focus primarily on Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. I would have to say now that their Chardonnay program is starting to take over their Pinot Noir program um, where they're making I think now eight different Chardonnays from different sites. Um, and they also work with a little Gamay as well. Uh, this is all destemmed fruit and goes into primarily Dame and Mercury barrels, French oak barrels, about 20% new. Again, indigenous ferment. There is a similarity in the fruit profile that comes through. Um, on the two and three wines in that sort of bright, lifted, um, almost a peppery, cranberry character that comes through that um, is what I find derivative of the volcanic soils. Um, even though they're volcanic soils in different AVAs, it does give that brightness and lift to the wines. Wine number four is the Irie Vineyard. This is Jason Lett's wine, um, so the son of David Lett. And these are the original Pinot Noir vines that were planted in 1965 in the Dundee Hills. 
So these are also volcanic soils. So you're going to, again, get that lift and spice and pure red fruit character. Um, but jory soils in the Dundee Hills tend to have a deeper soil depth to them. So being that our region is dry grown, we don't have irrigation. Um, we rely on dry farming. We rely on the rainfall that falls during the winter and the snowpack that falls during the winter. Um, the wines in the Dundee Hills tend to not go into um, stress at all or earlier, you know, later than wines off of the thinner volcanic soils um, in Eola, Amity, and McMinnville, and Chehalem. So these wines are, tend to be a little more plusher, a little more approachable than the volcanic soils of Eola, Amity, and McMinnville. Um, this wine is those two clones, Pomard and Badensville, and I think you can see them really playing out in the glass here. Jason also is very natural. There's no um, uh, no inoculation, only indigenous uh, yeast fermentation. Uh, these are own rooted phylloxerated vines, so he gets less and less production off them every year. Um, he's slowly interplanting um, mass cell selection from his own vineyard to re um, recuperate that vineyard. Um, and the wine stays on its lees for the entirety of its relationship in the barrel. Um, there's no racking it after Malo, it just stays in the barrel until he. Um, until the next harvest comes. And then the fruit from that harvest goes back into the barrel. He doesn't even, he just rinses out the barrel and puts it back. So it's almost like a layering effect of lees happening in these barrels. There is no new oak in Jason's cellar. He still has barrels that his father used in the 1960s. And then the outlier in the lineup is the Phelps Creek. So 2010 vintage um, from Phelps Creek, the Cuvée, Cuvée Alexandrine. Uh, Alexandrine Wah is a uh, producer from Volnay in, the, in Burgundy. Uh, and she comes over and makes the wine for Phelps Creek in the Columbia Gorge. So this vineyard, again, is uh, Pomard in Badensville. And this ha also has some 777 in it as well. Um, so made in a French style. Um, this wine does get inoculated uh, for malolactic though as well. Um, but as you can see from the color and style of the wine, it's a little bit darker, a little bit riper and denser. And that's also because it gets more of that wind influence coming from the Columbia River Gorge, the winds that come through that gorge area. I think increasingly in, in the climate as more, as more consumers start looking for organic certification and biodynamic certification. I think I think at the moment biodynamic certification is a little bit woo-woo and people don't really understand it. So you need to explain it takes a little more explanation. Whereas we've been in contact with organic food for so long now that organic is almost a certification that consumers understand. Whereas by biodynamics you almost need to be there at the vineyard to see and understand the processes that happen. Um, but once they do, I think that consumers definitely gravitate towards it. I think that's also a reason why we're starting to see more um, producers move to certification as opposed to just practicing it. Um, but again, you know, Oregon producers are it's the Wild West. They're sort of pi you know, they're pioneers and, and they don't always like to play you know, by other people's certifications. And so sometimes they go above and beyond and they just want to, you know, create their own essentially. So there is that sort of Wild West component, but also there's definitely an increase towards certification of both organic and biodynamic. I think it's more that the, you know, that there's a growing movement of what we don't want in our food and our wines and our bodies and in our lands. Um, and in our soils and with our children running through the vineyards or our neighbors who are helping us farm or, you know, we're a very small community. So um, there's a lot of social consciousness that's um, being applied now as well. So I think it's twofold. I think that, um, that with a warming and changing climate that biodynamics and organics, their practices of no tilling and um, you know, less soil compaction and less soil disruption also help to um, preserve the soil and the organic matter and hummus in the soil and also help us to preserve our water, which you know, we've had 
five dry vintages in a row now, and our vines are starting to feel it. Um, so I think that people are really starting to look towards those practices as preservation techniques instead of running the tractor through again, instead of tilling the row again. We're looking at cover cropping, we're looking at no-till farming to help preserve the health of our vineyards. And that also just relates directly then to who's in our vineyard as well. Um, and I think that's always you know, been some of the case with Oregon is that we're often winemakers that are, you know, working the land ourselves. And so we're very conscious about what we're putting on it. I think in other regions, when you have a viticultural management company farming your vines or you're an off-site owner, there's a tendency to not care as much or not be aware as much and to trust in the people that, are, that they're doing the right thing. Um, and I think also that comes down to economics as well. I just think that those lines get a little bit muddied when you have smaller producers who, who live on the estate and who are doing their own work. Um, it's really about the health of the vineyard, about the health of your place, what you're creating for your children going forward as well. Um, so it, it all ties in. Did I answer a question there? Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's take a look at some New Zealand wines. We're racing up to our lunch time break and more wine, of course. Um, number six on the table, which is the Wooing Tree. There are five different clones in, involved in making this wine. There is 30% new oak, but for only 10 months. And I think the message in the story, although the, uh, I must say that the thread of um, environmentalism in New Zealand when it comes to uh, wine producers is exactly the same as you've just described. That this wine, what a lot of winemakers try to do is get as much purity of fruit expression as they possibly can and the word pinosity must come into the vocabulary, into the verbiage of what, what we're looking. I love that word. <laughs> and, 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 and I think in terms of pinosity that this expresses it because it is a clonal blend. It is something that is hand harvested. It's uh, a wine that with only 4% whole bunch is really about the fruit and what we're getting from it. So it really speaks to um, two things. The voice of Pinot Noir from a region that is um, growing in popularity. This is from the Cromwell Basin area and some surrounding vineyards, but it's like Kumu River Winery in that it's stuck in the middle of urban growth. And so the main highway is running next door and there's a lot of houses being built and things like that around this vineyard. Um, what else can I say about this? It really is something that um, we, we like to showcase New Zealand Pinot Noir as a, as a platform. This is a great starting point. And the other wines, when we get to them, speak more to the soil than this wine does. Some of you might pick up on a little bit of that dried herb character on, on the nose, but that purity of fruit punches through mid-palate as well. And again, texture, texture, texture both on um, the nose and the palate. Nick Mills from Rip-On Wines always talks about the shape of the smell. And when it comes to Pinot Noir, because we normally just go, the wine smells like this, but he goes, no, wait a minute. What is the shape of that smell? And we get that a lot with Chardonnay. We go, oh, there's a big round buttery smelling wine and the word round is what I'm talking about. And so Pinot Noir should have shape and form on the nose which is the connection to Burgundy that, w that we try to make or allude to or connect with. And this is the Wooing Tree Pinot Noir from uh, a vintage that is classic for us, 2013. 14 is a great vintage for New Zealand. 15, 16 and 17 all had slight challenges, but they were by and large overcome. Um, 2018. Um, slight challenges again, but a very good vintage. 2019 is the, a, a gift again. It's that odd year. So 13, 15, 19 in terms of vintages. Watch out. 2019 is when they're released. Anyway, I hope you like the purity of fruit of that one. The second one that we're looking at is Escarpment. And I'm excited to show you this wine because I think this really does speak to sight. It speaks to the region. And first and foremost, that strawberry character on the nose. It's got that old grandma strawberry jam left in the refrigerator that you love to put on your toast on a Sunday morning kind of a smell. But it also has the soils here in the Escarpment Vineyard. It sits on a terrace. They're incredibly hard soils. 
very, very hard to get a vine in the ground here and almost to dynamite the ground point. But it's relatively open site, lots of silty deposits in these soils and so relatively free draining, but again, irrigation is needed. I like that clay, mineral, strawberry combination on the nose, but you'll notice the tannin profile of this wine is very different from the wooing tree, and it should be. Its Pinocity story is about um, aging. Its Pinocity story is about what the site can give us in terms of um, texture and profile. Oops, I swallowed that one. Um, I think that the youth of the soils in New Zealand shows through in this wine as well, because there is a, a rawness to the wine, there is an, a, a nakedness, if you like, to the wine on the palate, and those tannins are really quite driving tannins, but they're not, not invasive. These are wines that are built to age, and I think that shows through with the escarpment. The next wine for you, um, Dog Point, and I mentioned sort of that crunchiness of the Marlborough character that comes through, and I think that it comes through in our Pinot Noir, it comes through in our Chardonnay, uh, it comes through in the Sauvignon Blanc. So think about that, that crunchiness of the um, fruit with the Dog Point. Strong connection viticulturally to Cloudy Bay, the Dog Point owners are original growers for Cloudy Bay before they um, um, did their own thing. Multiple clones in here, about um, six or seven different clones in here, including the original Abel clone. Um, Marlborough soils, as alluded to before, are those free-draining, exposed riverbed soils. And Dog Point Vineyard, when you get to um, visit New Zealand, sits on an extremely open-faced, large, flat area. So whilst you can see the hills over yonder, there is a lot of vineyard between where you're standing and looking out across there. So there's a, um, an equal amount of um, wind to sunlight to irrigation. And whilst this is a quite unquote worked vineyard, I think that the character of the wine tends to show through. Wild ferment, multiple clones, a reasonable amount of um, leaf stirring and um, um, skin contact through here. Um, this is a wine where I'm hoping there would be some questions coming through. Oops, I swallowed that one as well. I swallowed that um, one too. Um, silky texture, fine tannins not invasive with its oak and again not to repeat myself too much but the panosity of this wine is about purity um, with this vintage um, being quite a classic vintage for us we are expecting this wine to age 10 to 15 years and um, certainly uh, a benefit to any wine program again there's a little bit of smokiness and dried herb character and I think that's to do with the younger soils that we have in New Zealand. There is that, um, um, what don't we have in our soils? We don't have any selenium, selenium, selenium in our soils at all. And it promotes the pyrazine character that we um, can have coming through. It's a thread, it's part of the story. Final wine in the lineup is the Rockburn. And I think the nose of this wine tells one of the stories of Central Otago quite distinctively, and that is that wild thyme, dried herb combination. And when you couple that with schist, um, quartz, and you know some wind-blown materials in these vineyards, this is the story of this Pinot Noir. It's, this is sight, barrel second. I feel like it has some of those similarities to to the Eola Amity Hills wines as well, mm -hmm. that sort of rawness and and yeah, proximity to ocean influence and almost saltiness and mm. herbal tea leaf notes that almost come through there as well. There's yeah, really you feel sight wines quite quite drastically in, yeah. in both of um, It's called the art series. I think it's more about winemakers' indulgence um, in this instance than it is um, the, the flagship 
wines that they make. So this is really all of about eight barrels of wine that, that are produced. And uh, I, I was excited to show you this wine because I wanted to give you a snapshot of a producer that uh, you may not have heard of before, but this is a combination of, as I spoke of, soil, um, the surrounding wild material, and, and, and the smell on the nose of this wine uh, proves to me, proves that um, soil can be translated into smell and flavor of wine. Definitely. Does anyone see similarities between Oregon and, and New Zealand Pinot Noirs? Besides obvious, the obvious Pinot, the <laughs> Pinocity. I find there's a clarity, that crunchiness and a clarity that I think comes through from that diurnal temperature yeah. shift, but also from that exposure to excess UV light as well. Um, you know, really preservations of, of, of crunchy, firm tannins, bright fruits from, from those, you know, warmer days, but then the larger diurnal shifts yeah. during night that both, both regions receive. Yeah. I think clean, clean would be a word that I would use yeah. as well. But there's a distinct, almost, I don't know, foresty or, you know, wildness to them as well. That's sort of the edge of the earth, sort of. Mm. So especially once you're tasting through those last ones. And I started going back, those are, um, the, uh, what, the escarpment was reminding me of some of the clay notes in, in the Beckham. And, you know, I was coming back in. And so that's when I was starting to do those comparisons. But it's mm. all on the palate. The noses are quite different. But on the palate, there's structural elements that, that come from, I think, the youth of the soils, the UV components, mm -hmm. and, and those diurnal shifts as well. We want to invite you to lunch, to join us for lunch and taste some other wines. And I think it's more of a self-pour session, but we're there to talk to you about the wines as well. And I, I think the one message to really take away from this flight of Pinot, Pinot's Noir is that we are not trying to make Burgundy. We are trying to express Oregon and we are trying to express New Zealand. And there's a very famous, uh, or what I think is a famous word in New Zealand called Turanga Wai Wai. I have to write it down, but Turanga Wai Wai. That means our home, our place. This is where we belong. And I think Pinot Noir really does express that quite well through this flight. All right. And we have whites, rosés, and sparklings at lunch. So something to you know refresh your palates again and bring them back up. So join us upstairs.